As a mathematician, I always like it when I can visually understand whatever it is I'm doing. Now, in most high schools, you will have seen a system of equations like this, two equations and two unknowns, and there's algebraic methods to be able to solve them. And then every linear algebra student is gonna learn how to figure out larger systems of equations with three or many more variables and equations. And don't worry about the details just yet, but the big idea here is to look at the coefficients of these equations, to take those numbers and pull them out into something called a matrix, and to do a bunch of algebraic manipulations on the matrix. When you translate that matrix back into equations, you get the simple answer that x equal to two, y equal to one, and z equal to one. So the point is, there's algebraic manipulations occurring, but my question for this video is, what does all of this mean geometrically? Now, the original system of equations are easy enough to visualize. In two dimensions, an equation like x plus y equal to three is an equation of a line. And so trying to solve for two such lines is just asking where is the point of intersection? The two lines could also be parallel, in which case there would be no intersection, or the two lines could be like right on top of each other, in which case there would be infinitely many points of intersection. In three dimensions, an equation like x plus y equal to three actually represents a plane. The third variable z could be anything. The first two planes intersect along a line and putting in the third plane gives one point that is the triple intersection of the three planes. And that's the point that we're trying to solve for. Again, two of these planes might've been parallel, in which case there would be no points of triple intersection, or it could be that they were oriented so that there was a whole line of triple intersection or even just the same plane three times over, which would mean the entire plane was points of triple intersection. So that's how you visualize the start, but what happens as we do algebraic manipulations? Let's do the two dimensional case and there's many different ways that you could solve this. The way I am gonna do it is I'm going to label the equations number one and two. I notice that there's an X in both of these equations. I kind of want to cancel it out. So I'm gonna take the second equation and subtract from it the first equation, leaving me with Y equal to one. You could substitute this back into either of these equations to get the value of X in an effort to be a bit more systematic. I'm going to relabel this as equation three and note that if I take say, you know, equation one and I subtract off my equation three, then I'm just left with X equal to two. Nothing fancy but let's track what's happening geometrically as I do these two different steps. Here are my two lines again, and when I subtract the first equation from the second, the consequence of that is that the diagonal line gets rotated around until it's now a horizontal line. What's crucial is that the point of intersection hasn't changed. We're just rotating around that point of intersection, but it itself is not changing, and then if I go and take this new y equal to one equation and subtract it from the first, the effect of that is rotating the first line to be vertical again without changing the point of intersection. Now, here's the key. It is really easy to see the solution when my lines are horizontal and vertical. It's just the lines x equal to two and y equal to one. And so the point has to satisfy both, thus x equal to two and y equal to one. Reading off the solution when they're aligned with the axes is easy. And so this two algebraic steps of subtracting one equation from the other is just equivalent to rotating these lines so that they become parallel to the X and Y axes. Okay, so now let's go to our example with three equations and three unknowns here. This is a simple enough system that you could just do it by hand without any formal techniques, but there's really three types of manipulations that you're probably likely to do if you were trying to solve something like this. The First is that I can always take one of the equations and multiply both sides of it by any non-zero scalar. For example, x plus y equal to three could become two x plus two y equal two times three. Visually, that doesn't change the plane at all. It's still just the same sets of x and y and z values, regardless of that scalar of multiplier. This is why I'm always allowed to multiply by scalars that isn't changing the point of intersection. I could also reorder the equation if I wish, like I could swap which plane is drawn first and which is drawn second. But again, that doesn't change what the point of intersection is, it just changes the order in which the computer draws the two planes. The third thing I can do, however, well, that actually does take some real work. This is adding a multiple of one of the equations 
to another equation. Like for example, if I have my three equations and if I label them one, two, and three, if I wanna cancel those x's and take the second equation minus the first equation, I'm using the third operation to do this, adding a multiple of one row, in this case, minus one times the first row, and I'm adding that to the second row. When we visualize each of these steps, what is happening is that the entire plane is gonna rotate so that it eventually gives the plane y equal to one, a plane which is parallel to the xz coordinate plane. Again, the intersection point isn't changing, our, our, our solution doesn't change. But now we're using a plane that's a little simpler because of this property of being parallel to one of the coordinate planes. If you then subtract multiples of the other equations, you get something similar. Each plane is being rotated through that intersection point until we have three planes, each of which is parallel to one of the coordinate planes. In this case, the planes are x equal to two, y equal to one, and z equal to one. So here's the big point. It is just so much easier to look at these three planes, and then you can just read off that intersection point. Well, it has to be x equal to two, y equal to one, and z equal to one. When we had our original three planes, without carefully plotting, you just look at the equations, but who knows where that intersection point is gonna be. But after you have rotated them in this way parallel to the coordinate planes, it's as easy as pie to be able to look at this and identify the intersection point. Now, I'll make sure to link some of my previous videos that dive deep into the specifics of the algebraic method that is Gaussian elimination. Basically, those three operations I told you about, you can strategize a little bit about how you apply those three operations so that you systematically get the answer. I'll leave that for my prior videos. So that's one geometric interpretation of what Gaussian elimination is doing, but I wanna give you another. Because anytime I talk about a system of equations, there's actually two major geometric interpretations of what's going on. I've shown you one that's very static. It's the intersection of lines and planes, but I wanna show you a more dynamic perspective. So going back to our two-dimensional example here, I'm gonna take the coefficients that appear, those numbers, and I'm going to reorder the data in a little bit of a different way. This is called matrix multiplication, and again, I'll make sure to link some videos to my prior linear algebra playlist for this. But the way I interpret it is, is it takes a generic x, y I'm trying to solve for, it does something called matrix multiplication to it and it spits out the value three, four. Now, this has a lovely dynamic picture associated with it. Here is what the matrix one, 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 two does to the x, y plane. It is something called a linear transformation, which means it takes all of the coordinate lines to new lines. And that's why we call it a linear transformation. In general, the first column in the matrix tells you where the point one zero is going to go. So under this transformation, the point one zero goes up to the point one one. And then the second column of the matrix tells you where the point zero one is gonna go. So zero one is going to go over to one two. So in our specific system of equations, reframed this way can be thought of as asking the question, for what starting point x, y under this transformation is it going to end up at the point three four? And so we can see that the original point two, one is the one that's gonna map on to three, four under this linear transformation. So I want to emphasize that the data here is the same. It's the same equations, the same sets of numbers. It's just that we have a really different geometric interpretation. Instead of thinking of it as static lines or planes intersecting and computing the intersection point, now we are thinking about it as dynamically as these linear transformations of the planes and points being transformed to other points. Okay, so back to our Gaussian elimination. Remember how we have these three different operations that we can do? In the old static picture, the first two didn't really do anything, but now they actually do something kind of interesting. If I start with the identity matrix, that leaves everything unchanged, and I multiply the first row by, say, two, this is the equivalent of stretching everything horizontally by a factor of two. So the first type of operation introduces these stretching factors. If instead I switched row one and row two, alternated their order, the visual effect is, is quite pleasing. It's one where all of the horizontal lines flip to be vertical lines and vice versa. But the really interesting one is what happens when I add a constant multiple of one row to the other. This is what is called a shear transformation, where, for example, everything moves only horizontally, there's ones where they only move vertically as well, but it's at different amounts depending on your vertical coordinate. This 
is a shear transformation. And so basically, each of these algebraic operations that I can do has a different geometric interpretation when I think about it in terms of linear transformations. Okay, so now I want to show you the steps of the Gaussian elimination on this matrix 1, 1, 1, 2, which I'm going to isolate. The first thing I'm going to try to do is look at this one that I have here, and I want to turn it into a zero. So I'm basically going to take the second row, subtract the first row, exactly like what I did before. But this time, I'm not going to do it by doing row operations exactly. I'm going to multiply it by a matrix. It turns out if you multiply on the left by this matrix 1, 0, minus 1, 1, that the effect of this is the same as doing the row operation, take the second row and subtract off the first row. And you get the resulting matrix 1, 1, 0, 1. This new matrix that I'm multiplying by, by the way, is referred to as an elementary matrix, which some linear algebra courses will sometimes very briefly say hello to. So I'm doing this elementary matrix here. And then I can do something similar again. I'm going to multiply both sides now by another matrix, another so-called elementary matrix. The effect of this one is to take row 1 and subtract off row 2 from it. Now I've gone into the identity matrix 1, 0, 0, 1, the matrix that doesn't do anything when you apply it as a transformation. So the basic idea here is that the original matrix I started with, 1, 1, 1, 2, you have these two different elementary matrices that convert it to being the identity. And so basically every row operation you ever do is paired with an elementary matrix. Instead of doing row operations, you can think of as multiplying by elementary matrices. I can invert and move these matrices to the other side. And I basically have a decomposition that the matrix that I started with, 1, 1, 1, 2, has been decomposed as the product of these two different elementary matrices. Okay, so that's some algebraic manipulation. What's happening geometrically? Here again was our original transformation. But if I decompose it as the product of two different elementary matrices, that means that I'm going to first do the 1, 1, 0, 1 transformations and only then do the 1, 0, 1, 1 transformation second. Here we see the effect of the first transformation. This now only moves points horizontally. It's one of those shear transformations that we were talking about. Then, if I apply the second transformation, it's only moving things vertically. It's another shear transformation. So this feature where the decomposition into two different elementary matrices is really taking this more complicated transformation and bringing it up as just doing two different simpler shear transformations one after the other. And so the Gaussian elimination procedure can be just thought of as this decomposition into these simpler transformations that are easier to track, easier to interpret, as it's only moving things vertically or horizontally. Now, at the end of the day, the Gaussian algorithm is an incredibly powerful algorithm, and it forms really one of the key bases for linear algebra. It's crucial for endless applications that this algorithm can be easily put into the computer, and we can solve systems with enormously large numbers of variables. And that algebraic procedure goes off and works regardless of whatever its visual intuition is. But I always do think that when we're trying to study something, when we're studying linear algebra, it is really nice to have these clear understandings of what is actually happening geometrically behind the algorithm. And with that said and done, we'll do some more math in the next video.